And you are very welcome along to this week's RT Rugby Podcast, Ireland 35-17 winners against Fiji at the weekend and rounding into their final in international of the year, taking on Australia this weekend. First time the sides will have met in four years since Ireland's tour of Australia back in 2018. And as usual, Bernard Jackman is with us here on the RT Rugby Podcast and also delighted to welcome on Christy Doran, Chief Rugby Writer for the roar uh, onto this podcast to kind of give us the lowdown on how Australia are going so far this season. Christy, thanks a million for joining us. I hope you're you're well settled in in Dublin now over the last couple of days. Oh, I can tell you there's a few envious Australian souls just thinking about the Guinness that have consumed the last few evenings, but it's been great and uh, spectacular weather this time of year. Any time of year you get some sun, blue skies, you're always surprised to, to think of that as an Aussie coming up here. And you're being you're being kept busy as well. I believe you were chatting to Andy Friend a couple of days. I don't know. Was it you that sparked his his resignation announcement? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I think he was actually rather relieved for it to get out there because you and I and Bernard would know these sorts of things. They don't just happen overnight, do they? <laughs> yeah, I know. Kind of, it had been in, kind of in the pipeline for a little while, is what we were expecting. But um, look, we brought you on obviously to talk about Australia. You might fill us in because off the face of it, defeat against Italy at the weekend, first time they were ever beaten by by Italy it's eight defeats and 12 down to world number nine in the rankings like just what's going on with Australia at the moment is it it's probably a very broad question I think to, to start things off but as best you can describe what is going on at the moment you'll yeah, well, pick your own adventure you're right it is uh, where to start and if you said eight from 12 but they actually lost the previous three matches uh to to round out last year in November so it's it's eleven from what fifteen uh, eleven from yeah fifteen there it's a horrible record and Dave Rennie was a man that many people thought was a very competent coach when he arrived down under in twenty twenty uh, you know he, people still remembered the the rapid transformation that unfolded with with the Chiefs in twenty twelve when he took over from Ian Foster and of course he led it, the Chiefs to a maiden Super Rugby title and they backed it up the year before. I think Australians thought that they were going to expect to see something very similar, a side that had perhaps struggled with consistency, but there was still enough talent within the, the playing group. But what we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, COVID didn't help, but it didn't help anyone, did it? And it, and it really stored some of the progression from younger players. But I think selection has been a, a massive concern for Australian rugby and the Wallabies, not just this year, but last year too, but certainly this year and, Right throughout the rugby championship, there was you were scratching your head over a number of selections, and even now, you know, less than a year out from a World Cup, only seven matches out from a World Cup, there was a uh, a rotation policy for halfbacks, and I, I don't quite understand how you can, you can't work out who your preferred nine is. And we saw twelve changes against Italy on the weekend, and it really came back to bite Dave Rennie in the backside because I don't know a, a single t one side other than perhaps the All Blacks that can ever really roll that out and put out and deliver a, a clinical performance. And we've seen the Wallabies stumble their way through the last matter of months and, and co- cohesion, the lack of continuity is there for everyone to see at the moment. So, uh, look, selection is the big one for me at the moment. There's enough talent and I actually think the Wallabies will come out and, and surprise Ireland. I think they can beat them. I predicted that Italy would beat the Wallabies. I thought they'd taken one eye off the Italians and, and already gone a step too far. But I think they'll they'll respond. And the Wallabies have this uncanny ability to win the games that they, they they probably shouldn't and lose the games that they should win. So we'll see over the, over the next few days. Yeah, and Birch, that, that, that's as Christy finished up there, winning the games that or losing the games they should win and no, maybe not winning the games they should win, but coming close to them anyway. And if you look at across a lot of those fixtures, the game against France a couple of weeks ago, uh, would have been big favourites against Scotland, stumbled over the line, then pick, picked off a win against South Africa, beat England as well. They, they're just a very, very hard team to get a read on at the moment, I think is probably the best way of putting it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm interested. I, I think David Rennie is a, is a very good coach uh, and any players or, or coaches that I've met have worked with him would speak very highly of him. Scott Weismantle is... You know, world renowned and world respected. Uh, Laurie Fisher's back involved, uh, I, I believe. Petra Stupa C. So it seems, it seems as if they have a very good coaching staff. But uh, um, uh, I suppose the question I would have for Christy is, is the talent there? Um, is the talent there 
insufficient depth. Um, like, I mean, you, you would have to imagine there was a plan for him to make so many changes against Italy in that he wanted to see what some of those players could do. And obviously, you hope you don't get the um, the negative bounce of, of obviously losing. But, I, I mean, how much pressure is he under? Um, do you believe that the talent is, is in this group? Obviously, if you obviously feel they're talented if they can, if you think they're going to beat Ireland, but you know, is it is it is the pool quite shallow, or um, you know, has he got the best players on the plane coming over here, and it's just a case of him trying to to work out what his best combinations are? Well, you, you look, is there enough talent in this in this side? We'll, we'll see. Is there enough talent in Australia? There certainly is. You look at the guys that are missing at the moment; and you, they roll off the tongue from Quade Cooper to Samu Karevi to Angus Bell to Isaac Rodder. Um, you know, there's there's quality from one to fifteen that is actually missing, unfortunately. But there's certainly enough talent, and that's why I think you know, he, he Dave Rennie was rattled after that game, and Rugby Australia was certainly rattled too. There is pressure on him. They've got to win at one one of these two matches, I would say, um, for him potentially to survive. Um, you know, it was only a mere four months ago that that uh, Hamish McLennan, the Rugby Australia chairman, backed Dave Rennie through to the World Cup, I think that could change if there's a, a really poor performance against Ireland. Uh, and we can't forget, and whilst Australia will be missing Will Skelton and Bernard Foley against the Welsh a week later, the Welsh clearly will be missing a few as well, given that the, the match falls outside the international window. So um, there is pressure, and, and quite rightly so, given everything we've seen. Discipline's been a huge one for, for Australia. We'll get to that probably a bit later, but... Um, I, I, I agree, and from what I'm hearing from the players, they also think that the coaching structure there at the Wallabies is is is, is first class. The the level of coaching is outstanding, but but you know there's a difference between um, um, you know delivering emphatic performances and and you know delivering some things on the on the training field. We we understand that the Dave Rennie game plan is a really ta- um, complex one that that. Um, and and someone like a Quade Cooper was was delivering it. He's got such a huge intellect, and Quade's only played less than one match this year. He took the Wallabies to five straight games last year, and and without Quade Cooper this year, there's not been a real there's not been a Johnny Sexton in the side. And whilst that's provided opportunities for guys like Noel Orsio, more recently Bernard Foley, um, James O'Connor had a crack, and and I would say got speared by Dave Rennie. Um, the handling around the 10 situation in the nine is perhaps the most surprising of the lot because we saw him develop Aaron Cruden at the Chiefs right back in the day. So there are significant issues when it comes to selection, which I think is unfortunately it's 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 having a detrimental impact on, on discipline um, because players don't necessarily know where they are, what ruck they should be hitting. Um, the attacking clean out has been an absolute mess for a long, long time. Interesting, just in your opinion, our, our insight into what's it like above Dave Rennie. I remember, I remember during the Czech era, um, it seemed to be a little bit of disarray and, and a poor relationship with the board, um, and maybe a lack of consistency or cohesion there. Financial issues, um, apparently as well are reported. I mean, is the board in a position to to make a drastic decision, um, like you know maybe relieving Dave Rennie of his duties or? Um, what's the outlook for, for from Australia from a a financial point of view? You know, over the next couple of years as well. Yeah, good question, and they play a role with what's going on at the moment. I think for two reasons, it's unlikely that Dave Rennie will go. Um, one, they'll have to pay him out for an extra year, but two, the, there's no apparent um, replacement coach, and and that's always a big one, isn't it? Um, we saw when um, you know in 2018 when Rassi Erasmus came in, he was clearly a an outstanding coach that had had runs on the board. Um, I don't necessarily think that we see that at the moment. Dan McKellar is someone that's been spoken about as the assistant at the moment, but this is really, he's coming to the end of his second year as an international assistant coach after running a Brumbies, Brumbies program for five years. He's he's perhaps the most likely, if anything, was to occur, but... Um, they, they, you know, the, the financial position of rugby Australia has improved drastically over the last twenty-four months. Really, they were close to going under in the you know, second quarter of of twenty twenty, but there's been some huge steps taken since the sponsorships have come back on. 
Um, they really streamlined the administration and the and the entire rugby Australia from more than two hundred people working there down to fifty. Um, massive steps were taken so that that it didn't go insolvent and um, yeah, they 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 wouldn't. They were, their least preference, of course, would be to 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 make a move on Dave Brownie, but there is complete and utter frustration at what's going on over the last few months because uh, losing to Eddie James's England after being one nil up, having opportunities to finish the job when you've got packs audiences, you know, from my understanding, there was a big sponsor potentially on the cards meeting rugby Australia in Italy at, uh, over the last weekend, but it's hard to, hard to, to sign off on these sorts of deals, isn't it? When you go down against Italy. How much, um, how much urgency of the situation is there? If you look at the, the world cup next year, where, as tough as things have been on the pitch for Australia in the last you know, this season, there's a massive opportunity for them at the World Cup next year. Because if you look at the pool they're in, like without being disrespectful, Wales, Fiji, Australia at the moment, that's not a particularly strong pool on paper anyway at the moment. And if you just even look at the side of the draw they're on, if you can get your things right over the next 12 months, for someone on that side of the draw, and even for the England Argentina side of the side as well. Like there's a massive opportunity to get to a World Cup semi final or beyond next year. Yeah, we we know, or perhaps the Irish don't know what happens at a semi final. But <laughs> but but you're right, and and that's the um, you know, this Australian side has shown that they're very much capable of producing one good performance, and we've seen that right throughout this year. And and they yes, you're right. They stumbled. They lost by a point against the French, and they had a very controversial last minute try to New Zealand down in Melbourne. So they can deliver performances and you're right, you know, you would not be on a, not like to be on a side of the draw, which you know that two of Ireland, South Africa, France and New Zealand aren't going to make it through to the semifinals. It seems preposterous when you look at the current world rugby rankings, but, but yeah, you're right. Australia can make it through to the semifinals and it wouldn't surprise me. I don't think they've got three good games in a row at the moment, but they could certainly get to two. And that's the thing that is exciting, but also, um, uh, you know, Dave Rennie in the Wallabies, I, I do think that they can be one of the great shocks at next year's World Cup. And, and same with, you know, England wouldn't be a shock, I don't think, but I think they're pretty well set up, aren't they, to be on that side of the the draw if they beat Argentina you know I think we saw what they can do against the Japanese side over the weekend and the flip side obviously then as well is that if things don't go well at the World Cup next year everything in theory had fallen in Australia's favour with the pool and that's even more damaging yeah and there's a little bit of a thought about you know what the French did um, in 2019 when Fabian Galtier came in and, and, and there seemed like there was a bit of a generational change and he was looking not so much at the 2019 World Cup, knowing that he's got some great young uh, players there, but we're targeting the home World Cup in 23 and there's a similar sort of thought around the 27 World Cup. Sorry, I just had a, um, just had a phone cut, cut me out there. Yeah. There's a similar thought process there with the Australians. I know that Hamish McLennan is certainly targeting the 2027 World Cup and, you know, making a, a drastic step perhaps next year may be the best thing for a home World Cup and to because rugby are, is kind of on the nose in Australia at the moment. It's, you know, it's in a really kind of odd situation where there's so many competing forces down there and it's not just a, a super rugby competition and the neighbours across the ditch in New Zealand, like, there's, there's, it's really hot competition down there with with the rugby league and the AFL particularly. Yeah, let's get let's get into that side of things because I think it's something we've kind of been speaking about for years now. Is just the the extent of the competition for for hearts and minds that rugby union has down in Australia and how probably rugby league and AFL have long passed it. Like where where is it standing in that that ladder of popularity and how how much is that affecting the draw of obviously finances to the draw of you know the player pool and and the, and the knock on effect of everything else and even just the the reputation of it yeah the player pool one's a really interesting one and the talent identification because there's been numerous players that continually get lost to rugby league but but that's always gone on really and it's gone on for years and years and years you know the former greats of russell fairfax and wally lewis guys that were playing either for the wallabies or the junior wallabies ricky stewart a great player 
who's gone on to be a, a great coach as well. Um, another guy that came through the Australian schoolboy system. So um, that's always going to be an issue. Where does it rank? It, it ranks down at four or five. And if you speak to most people, really, like uh, it, it can dip even to six and seven when you throw in cricket and other other sports like now the Formula One, which is which is huge down in Australia, and and boxing, which has had a uh, a rise as well, and a bit of a turnaround over the last couple of years with a couple of young talented boxers. But it, you know, the Wallabies when they win, they'll always be able to attract a crowd, and we've seen that time and getting time again. Um, but there are a lot of people that have been incredibly frustrated with just how inconsistent they are, and and then when you get to the comp, the um the complexity of the rules and the laws of rugby. Uh, it's something that when you look at rugby league and it's so simple and it's so one dimensional, um, for me, it doesn't necessarily appeal, but for a lot of people it does because they see what goes on with, with yellow red cards, with controversial kind of deliberate knockdowns and the ruck, which is a mess for most people to understand. And then you throw in the scrum. So those sorts of things, you know, it all seems rather rosy and I love the intricacies of the game up here but there is a lot of other people down in Australia that that perhaps don't. 2027 then having the the rugby world cup is that is that one one big desperate push to 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 win back a few people? Oh, it is. It is indeed, but it will be well supported because it's it's going to it's not going to just come out of random it's not, it's not like the 2020 world cup which of course the Irish had a pretty successful campaign down in Australia just recently, but that was terribly supported because, you know, there's a world cut there every one or two years, not necessarily in Australia, but across the world. And, but for the rugby world cup, it's obviously going to have been 24 years. That'll be very well supported. And uh, uh, who, who manages to secure the world cup final, we'll see over the next probably six months, but um, yeah, that's going to be a competition between Sydney, Melbourne, and and Perth. But it'll be it'll be a brilliant spectacle down there. I have no doubt. Did two thousand and three have the desired desired impact? Because I suppose on the face of it, you know, there were reigning world champions coming into it, a home world cup, and even if they didn't win, they got to a final. Um, but did it did it have the lasting effect? It probably would would have been hoped for. Well, it's. Uh, it, John O'Neill, who's the, the CEO at the time, has been, you know, coming to huge criticism for what happened afterwards, really, that there was a, a massive treasure chest, a war chest of about $40 million that back then is obviously a, a reasonable amount of money. And what happened was, you know, they, they sat and, you know, you could have an entire week of conversations regarding this one. But, you know, they, they, there was a rapid expansion from Super Rugby from three to four to five franchises, Um a competition that perhaps started to lose the interest of those that were supporting it. And that was a big one, but where was the money spent? There was the implementation years later of a third tier kind of competition, which for many people still is a really important thing to kind of be able to get back off the ground. But was the money properly spent, well-resourced, high big contracts for certain, you know, dual internationals like Lottie Dekiri and others, um, there's a multitude of reasons for it, but it certainly wasn't the best resources for it. And and, and I, they're, they're paying the price now and they have been for many, many years. To get back to the the on the on pitch matters, Birch, to put you into the into the mind of Dave Rennie, back into the into the coach's box. If you're essentially fighting for your job a little bit, and a quarter of an hour into that game against Italy, you see Jake Gordon just fly in and take out Tommaso Allen off the ball down the touchline. One of the most needless shoulder charges you're probably ever going to see. And to be honest, didn't even really leave too much on him. It wasn't the most forceful, but it was just completely stupid. And Australia scored, or not Australia, sorry, Italy scored two tries across those next 10 minutes. How absolutely furious are you as a coach when you see something like that? Uh, look, at it. it's um, it's gut-wrenching. And, and when teams... Get that, let that ill discipline seep in. Um, it's very, very difficult to eradicate it or stop it. And we see Vern Cotter, you know, with Fiji at the moment going through a a similar um a similar issue and getting it right um and getting players to understand the consequences of the of their actions and staying in system um and staying legal is 
uh, is crucial in, in in the modern game. And and I I like I'm sure Dave Rennie has been harping on about discipline, um, but for whatever reason at the moment his team are ill disciplined, um, and that's got to change. I mean Ireland are normally a very disciplined uh, team, um, particularly for foul play. So. Um, it's something that they're going to have to get right this week, and and it's going to be difficult because the atmosphere is going to be hot and heavy. There's pressure on Australia, and sometimes when there's pressure on you, um, you you can go out of out of norm and and make make that try and make that big play that costs your team. So I'd be fascinated to see what they've been doing this week. Um, uh, and I'm surprised to be honest because against Italy they weren't really being stretched. Like they they are against some of the better teams, um. But yes, uh, it, it was poor. So, and, and pressure can do some, you know, pressure can affect individuals in different ways. But at the moment, the moment that's something that's holding back. I I agree with, um, with Christie. I think their attacking game is is beautiful to watch. It's very intricate. It's it's um it's highly dangerous from an Irish defensive point of view. Um, both teams. Some, some of the back. some of some of those scores against France were yeah. Absolutely, they're, they're magic. off the charts. Like, yeah, no, no, they've got loads of individual brilliance. They've got the the structure and the philosophy, um, and I suppose the the license from the coaches to try things, which makes them hard, you know, hard to predict. It makes them hard to shut down. Um, but if they don't get that discipline inside of the right this weekend, you know, they just they won't have a chance. I don't think. Yeah, and it's going to be, it's going to be incredibly intense. Um, you know, late kickoff, Ireland going for obviously, you know, I think it's the first time we'd have beaten. New Zealand, South Africa, and Australia, and um, finish off the series. Um, the atmosphere is going to be brilliant, and and the players need to stay stay calm and, and stay in the uh, in the zone. And Christy, how much, how much of an improvement, or how close to their best can Australia be? If not even if they just completely eliminate the the discipline issues, but just trim it down to a more respectable total, like trim it down to to maybe 10 or just under 10 penalties a game like how how close to their best can they can they be in that case well we've seen and I'm trying to predict the world is is, is not on impossible but we've seen as as we've said a couple of times that um that they do have a, a good performance in them oh look i think they they're paying down australia 6 6 dollars 50 to to win this game the the world is against ireland which i think is just extraordinary though you wouldn't have ever seen those numbers beforehand but look a side that has nick white at nine and burn foley at, at, at 10 uh, um you know will skelton probably will feature somewhere uh michael hooper at seven rob valentini's class and he's going to be at eight you know like there's a there's enough class strength firepower there will be a pretty good forward pack whether or not um but, but for me I keep coming back to when you talk about discipline. When when players don't necessarily know their rules, uh, their their roles, they often look for individual kind of moments, don't they? And and it might be the over eagerness, of the offside, or you know trying extra hard at the breakdown, or it might be, you know, that that clumsy, that ridiculous shoulder charge, or you know taking a man off the ball like Tom Robertson did as well. So there's many many. There's many, many um, uh, factors about this Australian side which are moving all the time because of the constant changes. So we'll see. But this is a team that that, that well, we saw two weeks ago managed to nearly shock France and, and play with some fluency in attack. So fingers crossed from a, a game perspective that we see another good one because we have no doubt that the Irish are going to come and deliver and their multi-phase attack and playing the... the you know the blind side consistently off nine as well. This is a a class side which is probably at the peak of the powers. But you know the the big question is going to be is is Ireland once again peaking a year out from the World Cup? Oh, we've been asking that question for a long time here, Christy. Don't worry. <laughs> um, first, Christy did mention one player there, and I nearly got the shivers coming up my spine when I heard his name, Will Skelton. He there's there's something about Will Skelton and Irish teams that. Well, they don't go together from an Irish point of view. They certainly go together from Will Skelton's side. Yeah, look, Christy, the background is he he broke our heart, Leinster <laughs> hearts with Saracens and, and La Rochelle uh, in particular a few times. Uh, look, I I think it's a, it, it'd be really interesting to see if he can have that effect at international level. We're kind of, 
we're clapping ourselves on the back a little bit at the moment because we dealt with the South African power, Christy. So, um, you know, maybe we're not as fearful as as, as we were of of, of the Will Skelton ties. But look, he's a he's a he's a very effective rugby player, and whether it's starting or off the bench, uh, I'm looking forward to, to to seeing him play. Um, yeah, I think this is this is a brilliant. Obviously, you've got a test match next week against Wales, but um, it's a it's a pretty tough schedule. You know, Scotland, France, Italy, um, Ireland, Wales, and, and uh, as a, as a group, I know they're staying up the road in Radisson. I think, you know, this this, this could be a, an unbelievable month for for the Wallabies if they can get more positive. If they can finish positive um over the next two weeks, and in terms of, you know, building, and then obviously then you start to refine things going into the last the last blast for the World Cup. But um, and having someone like Wise Mantle in there who's been to numerous World Cups, whether through Japan or England, um, I think can be really beneficial and. You know he's very close to Eddie Jones. Eddie Jones seems to have the model for for World Cup. So I think there's there's a lot of IP in that group, and um, yeah, I I'm fascinated to see how they react this week. Um, I'm open they don't obviously get a win, but I, I do think it's going to be the most for me. It's the most exciting game of the series for us because we haven't we weren't able to play against South Africa because of their strengths. Um, Fiji. He lacked a little bit of cohesion and there was a lot of ill discipline and very stop start. But I genuinely feel that both Ireland and Australia have a very good philosophy in terms of how they want to play with tempo, with width, moving the ball. So it could be it could be one of the better games. And there's been some really good games in November, but it, it could certainly be the best game that um that we've had. I, I and I completely agree. And and then you look at what momentum can do and it, you know it was a powerful thing for the Springboks back in 2018 and they they had a real marker against the All Blacks in Wellington where they shocked a lot a lot of people and it really set them up for the next year it was a, a spring bond, it was a springboard for them and you know if you look at the other way back in 2014 you know, one of the last times that um, Michael Check well, Michael Checker comes over and, and replaces you and McKenzie, and I think they only won one from four matches on that tour, and it was a pretty dicey start. But that was also another thing where you know structures get put in place, great opportunity to put your fingerprints on a on a side, and they they might not have had the desired performances and the results, but you know that 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 moment there was a lot of the guys that they knew. What was going to happen underneath the Michael Checker coach Wallaby side? I, I think this is a hugely important one now, though, for for Dave Rennie. And you're right, Scott Wisemantle was a a smart, cunning character with, um, you know, one of the more colourful characters of the game. A bit like Mark Hansen, kind of says what he what says what he wants at particular times. Uh, there's enough coaching IP within this with this side, and you know, Laurie Fisher, of course, spent years at, at Munster as well, and a guy that I think will be one of the better coaching moves for Australian rugby because he, he demands detail, demands work ethic. And you could hear him in his training yesterday barking orders and, and expressing what he thought wasn't good enough on the training field. Yeah, and you mentioned Mac Hansen there. Let's let's talk about him because obviously there's a there's a really enjoyable narrative just going around him all this week. Obviously his first time playing against Australia. And as you were talking about just there, the difference in a short period of time, like when Michael Cechik came in, you can certainly say the same about Mac Hansen because I don't think too many people on this part of the world knew his name 18 months ago and all of a sudden he's a he's an established international cult hero at Connacht. You might take us back to before he, he joined Connacht and came over to Ireland. When like when that was announced, was there much was there much frustration that he was being, you know, what was, was he seen at the time as potentially one that was being slipping through the cracks or, you know, would anyone really have thought he had this career ahead of him? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I wouldn't have thought so. I, I, I had been very impressed with him because I saw what he could do and how he moved. The fact that he was a bit of a utility playmaker almost out in the wing and, he was stuck behind Tom Banks, really, at the Brumbies and limited opportunities there. There was Tom Wright, there was Andy Muir ahead. And, and he was, you know, the Brumbies have been the most successful and consistent side in Australian rugby for a long, long time. So he'd had, a, you know, some really good cameos for the Junior Wallabies and that was not even long ago. And and I was surprised, disappointed. I'd messaged Dan McKellar going, what the heck's happened here? Like, this is a guy that can play 15, 10 wing it seemed like a no-brainer that you keep on to him. But 
I don't think the rest of the Super Rugby franchises in Australia really looked at him twice. Um, and, you know, it probably really only registered on in Australian shores that he had gone when he scored an out-of-the-world kind of try against, uh, well, for Connacht and, you know, took a high ball and managed to weave his way through. There might have been a chip and chase in there as well at the same time. But when he had that man of the match, player of the match performance, to kickstart the Six Nations, and then he plucks the ball through the air um, in in Paris to score against the French. There was a lot of finger pointing and questioning, and how how Australian rugby let go of another gem. And oh, I think it's you know Dan McKellar kind of expressed it the other day when he addressed the media. Said you know it is a bit of a case of if if, if what if. Just just um, I remember this time last year there was talk about Australia having a look at him before Ireland. Brought him in for November. And he, there's been a bit of talk about John Porch. So another winger who's come to Ireland and, and you know, been exceptional for, for Connacht and hasn't been picked up by uh, by Ireland, which he I think he qualifies for or will qualify for soon. Was there ever any chance um, that Australia would look to to bring him in? Or are you are you pretty happy that you've got the um, the depth that in the backfield um, that you can do without him? Well, I actually, I asked Andy Friend that question the other night because he's a guy that um, was pretty good in rugby sevens and had been, you know, he probably played for the rugby seven side for a good three years before going over to Connacht. Um, I, I know that there's been some discussions with different Australian Super Rugby franchises about John Porch and, and where that's progressed, I'm not 100% sure, but he's been spoken about for quite a few months now and I oh, it wouldn't surprise me if, if Australia does pick him up and he, he's he's got the good fundamentals and, and you know, anyone that comes through rugby sevens, you get exposed if you're not good on the ball, you know, if your core skills aren't great. And so he, I, I think he'd be in a shit signing. Whether or not he's a wallaby, I'm not sure. But, you know, depth can't be a bad thing, can it? On that, just very quickly on that, on just on the, the topic of sevens, because... That seems to be an area where Australia have, have really actually improved, kicked on in the last few years as well. Is it, have, have they like a long-term strategy where, you know, could you potentially see sevens essentially becoming more popular than rugby union? To to go back on what you were saying, there's huge frustrations around union of, you know, stoppages in the game, the like TMO referrals, slow play, things like that. Like sevens is automatically a, a pretty quick antidote to all of that, isn't it? Oh, Neil, it sounds great, uh, but I can stop you dead in your tracks. I don't, I don't think so, no. Oh, for, for the for the women, um, they've clearly they've, they won the gold in, in 2016. And, and I think that also that contributed to a lot of women um, starting to play the game. And you could see that from a grassroots level, but I don't think necessarily for the men's. Um, how they've got there is, is quite remarkable. You know, it was only you know, 16 months ago or so that, you know, off the back of a pretty dire Olympic campaign where both sides got knocked out in the quarterfinals, that the men's program got ripped in half and you know, money got pulled out of it. And, and John Menenti's coach just kind of described his playing group as Menenti's misfits. And it's kind of pretty apt, but you know, I, I think there's some good lessons in there for not just for the sevens program, but for the Wallabies and for the 15 side that working hard, seeing what it, you know, losing some of your mates who have been denied contracts and not have contracts renewed, those sorts of principles about having to work hard and 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 not um, and demanding excellence. I think players had taken things for granted for quite a while in that sevens program. So whether or not we see that in the 15s, I'd like to. Whether or not we see the sevens become a real strength in Australian rugby, I think it will always be there because there's enough athletes in the game. But I, I, I can't see it ever surpassing the 15s and the gravitas that, that holds. Sounds very similar to here. Birch, um, on Ireland this weekend and last weekend, I suppose, against Fiji, wasn't obviously a particularly good performance against Fiji. Very, very sloppy. Is it? Is it no harm that that performance has kind of cropped up and the way Andy Farrell has reacted to it, he's clearly not happy with it, with the quotes he said after the game and judging off what the players were saying yesterday as well, it seems they were, they, they, they were told about it on Monday morning in the review. Yeah, look, I don't think it's any harm. It's it's good to win with playing poorly. Um, it's good to have that little bit of a shock to the system, bringing back down to earth, gearing up to what obviously is a hard, harder test by by 
I think it was pretty easy to get yourself up for South Africa. It's been in, in the eye line for a long time, um, a two-week build-in, the world champions, etc. There was probably naturally going to be a little bit of an emotional um, dip, early kickoff, some changes. But this is now, you know, this, uh, Sexton's back as well. And Sexton is, is basically the, the, you know, a thermometer gauge of, of, of the intensity levels, of the accuracy levels that he... It's no disrespect to the people who replace him, but he just is at a different level in terms of making everybody on point um, and helping people get into the game and, and execute. So the fact that he's back and looks like he's okay, I know Ross Byrne was brought in, but it seems Johnny's okay. Um, that, for me, brings Ireland's level up you know, 10% anyway. Uh, plus the the opposition in the eye line um, being Australia, um, the, the quality of rugby they can play will... Will make will I think make the players more accurate in itself just because they know they can't be sloppy. Um, and then obviously that little bit of a of a of a backlash from Faz. Um, I, uh, and a few starters come back in. I think you know if Ireland lose this weekend to Australia, it'll be down to Australia being better than us. Um, I I think from a preparation point of view, everything will be spot on. Yeah, Gen- gentlemen, can I can I just jump in? It sounds oh, great, though. Like- it sounds great. You're debating a, a game where you've won by nearly 20 points. Uh, it all sounds pretty rosy from a perspective from Australia, who clearly didn't deliver a performance and got beaten. I think you're bang on the money there, Bernard. But like delivering a, a performance, winning when you're not playing, is the hallmark of a side. And you look at all the All Blacks teams that won for years and years. They they often won when they delivered a, a good 15, 20 minute period and that was about it the fact that you managed to blood another 10 n- not have johnny sexton in there is probably the best thing for the game so i think it was only an encouraging performance yeah and birch I'd, like of that game against fiji <clears throat> without dwelling on us like any any few players that did put up their hands and and kind of stamp down their stamp down their feet and show andy farrell what they were made of um look i, I don't think there was any real bad performances i, I thought um I thought McCluskey again, um, you know, looked really good. I'd be really interested to see if he starts this weekend. I know yeah. Bundy's back, but I personally what would, you, would. What would you? What would you go for personally? Yeah, I'd stick with Stewart. I think we know Bundy can do yeah. at international level. Um, he's not going to be Matt Sharp, obviously, having been out for uh, suspended um, since that Stormers game. And I would stick with McCluskey. I would show real confidence in him. He, you know, he obviously had to go off injured in the first game against South Africa. Um, he's been in great form for Ulster, so I would I would stick with him. Um, I thought Crowley looked really good last thirty. Um, obviously coming off for Joey Carby and with Joey, obviously if you haven't failed his HIA, this is another chance for him to to get some valuable game time. I mean, if he's going to be the third choice ten at the World Cup, you would like him to have been involved in five or six, you know, match day twenty threes at least, and, and obviously that's going to be difficult. Um, now so this is this could be an opportunity for him to get some game time. Um. And yeah, look, I think we know what our best team is now. You know, uh, we know what our best team. So Treadwell did great, but I think he's an impact sub. I think he's better suited to that coming off. Uh, Timoney did really well, but is he going to is he going to force out Josh Renner Fleer? No, mm-hmm. um, not at the moment. With the way Josh is playing, um, so yeah, I, I don't think, I think from a far point of view, he would be happy that Joey looked good for fifty. Obviously disappointed he got injured, and that Crowley looked really comfortable because that's the key for us is to guess. To get clarity around two and three at ten above everything else, that's the that's the big worry for Ireland. Obviously, if that happened to Sexton, we need to know that the the drop off isn't too too big. What's the what's the opinion of Ireland down in Australia? Is this is it a Johnny Sexton plus fourteen others? It, you know, is there are are they looking around like who, who are the players that that the Australian fans would look at on the Irish team and go, whoa, he's he's something else? Or you know, is there is, is there opportunities, is there holes in the team? They think. Oh, look, I've been saying for years, and I think you know, it's no rocket scientist to work this round out. I think there's been so much reliance on Johnny Sexton. Like, if he's out, like, stocks will plummet for Ireland, won't they? Um, yeah. For for a World Cup. So I, I was surprised that there wasn't, you know, coaches because of the importance of having to win and turn up every week. They very rarely look beyond their own hedges, their own backyard. I, I was staggered that there wasn't more of a search to find who's the next 10. You oh, know we've Johnny's... Been, oh, we've been searching, Christy. Don't worry. We've, we have been searching. We just but, have not found. <laughs> yeah, but it's a very similar sort of case with, I think, someone like Anoa Lolasio, who, you know, 
you, you might give one opportunity in a blue moon to players they rely on confidence and we know that how the plan the game plan that Ireland deliver is a complicated one it's it's a huge amount of IP that needs to go into that. So it's never going to be perfect after one or two or three matches. I think that's the one thing that Eddie Jones should be really applauded for is he often makes a decision and fair play to him. It's a big decision. And sometimes he rips it out and starts again, but he makes a big call. I I'm, I think everyone looks at this Irish side and says it's, it's very good, but but um, you know, there's huge questions there. Knowing that next year, knowing that the the head c- concussion kind of protocols, it could spell absolute calamity and drama for Ireland if if anything was like that to to take effect. But you know, there's class in the side, and you know, you've just mentioned Josh Van der Flair. He was just brilliant against the All Blacks down back in July. We know that you know the Peter Romani's, the guys that would yeah. just die for you and 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 continually work away in the trenches. Uh, it's it's a good side, and there's not too many holes throughout. I think their full your fullback um, Hugo Keenan is is class, and when you've got an axis of a nine, ten, fifteen that you know, you know, there's depth there with Robbie Henshaw, who's obviously going to be missing this week with injury, but great depth there, and and the the talent ID that you guys have done, and what David Nisifora has done has has been a outstanding. Um, but the big big question I still have is is that ten if anything happens to Johnny. You're about yeah, to... I, I think I, I just on that, just on that, uh, Christy. We, we we have we have obviously known this, and it's amazing that we're going into another World Cup very dependent on him. But I agree with you. It's it's that pressure that's on international coaches to win now. Um, and then and, and again, I, I I totally, I was thinking about Eddie when you were saying it before you you mentioned him. Like he's probably. And look, he, he after losing to Argentina, he was coming under a lot of pressure. But he's so self assured that he's going to be there for the World Cup. He's probably on so much money; it's going to be hard to pay him out. Um, he obviously it's he's able to make those decisions, and 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 look at he's been criticised the weekend Argentina match. He's been criticised for trying too many players and not giving him enough games. But uh, before he cuts him loose again, but I think his argument would be he's seen enough, um, and he's not going to persevere, you know, with those guys. And um, but there's no coaches, sorry, there's so few coaches in the game at the moment who have the legacy at World Cups he has. That he probably can convince a committee, he's he knows more than they do or the media, you know. So it's um it's a tough one. We're running out of time here, guys. So I think you're both going to be relieved. We're not going to have too. We're not going to have time at all, actually, to to talk about Razi Erasmus. We'll uh we'll wait for next week because I'm sure he'll have a uh, another handful of videos to. We'll to rugby pass. World rugby's rugby pass. They'll tell us what what. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We can tune in this weekend. Uh, God help us all if they lose against Italy. That's all I'll say. Um. Quick fire questions for you guys because the World Rugby nominees came out at the start of the week. The the winners I think will be announced this weekend in Monaco. Just very quickly, uh, Birch, Coach of the Year, Andy Farrell, Fabian Galtier, Simon Middleton, Wayne Smith. Who who get your vote? I actually go for for Wayne Smith. I think what he's, uh, you know, the fact that New Zealand were so far away, you know, uh, a year ago, a bit of a mess, and he's just he he's done something incredible. So uh, for me, Wayne Smith. Yeah, I think it'd be hard to look past that. Christy? Yeah, I think just from a PR perspective as well, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? Um, I think, fair enough, what what he's done, I reckon there would have been a lot of people jumping on the, the Black Ferns there um, leading into the World Cup, knowing that Wayne Smith was there. I, I would go Fabian Galtier. you will go Fabian Galtier, okay. Breakthrough Player of the Year, Mac Hansen, Dan Sheehan, Henry Arundel, Ange Capuzzo, Christy? Uh, Ange Capuzzo for me, I think just uh, the fact that, that that try against the Welsh and we saw what he did on the weekend, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if, if Mac Hansen is there. What a what an unbelievable breakout year. Now, Bernard? Yeah. Um, I don't want Ange Capuzzo to get it because he was in Grenoble when I was there and uh, we thought he was too small to make it. So, uh, <laughs> and I would just, I would just rub it in a bit more. I just want him to go away quietly. No, uh, no, I, I think he's he's amazing, and I love watching him. He's playing for Toulouse now, um, and he could be the one who who changes Italy's uh, fortunes. You know, he could give him that spark. So, uh, uh, for me, yeah, look at we're going for if we go for Wayne Smith and and and, and Andrew, maybe not the highest profile wins, but I do think he's he, he's been phenomenal. And then the big one, Player of the Year, Josh Fenderfleer, Johnny Six, and Antoine Dupont, Lucan Yuan. Who wants to go first? Just the overview of visitors. Uh, it, it's runs a toss of the coin, isn't it? 
Um, uh, the, the awards are, are named next week, aren't they? So, look, I, I feel like almost this weekend should have a little bit of, of a say. You know, if, if Josh van der Flair manages to help Ireland to a victory, then perhaps he. Uh, we know that Anton Dupont had a bit of trouble last week, but I think his year and what France has done becoming Six Nations champions is unbelievable. Uh, maybe he, he's such a self-assured player, so self-confident that maybe it won't affect him. But you'd wonder what these sorts of awards can do to players at times. But I think the sky's the limit for France at the moment. Um, I'd go to Pont just. And Birch? Yeah, I'll go, um, I'll go Van der Fleer because I think to Pont, uh, I, I, I've known about him since he was... He was 16. He's always been incredible. Uh, I think Van der Fleer has transformed his game, so I admire that. Um, you know, he's always been a good player, but he's now he's now probably an all-rounder, so I think if he has a big game this weekend, he'd be in pole position. Personally, I think Van der Fleer has to have a nightmare this weekend to not win that award. As I, I, said, don't well, just I don't know if it's just me. I, I nearly would have had Greg Aldrin over Antoine Dupont if you yeah. were a French nominee, but look at um, I can't see Van der Fleer not winning this award. Um, so, Birch, Christy Doran, thanks a million for joining us on this week's podcast. Enjoy your, your few days left in Dublin. I'm sure I'll I'll see you at the Aviva at the weekend, Christy, and uh, Bernard as well. Thanks a million, as always. We'll Great. be back for more on the RT Rugby podcast next week. Thank you.